Thanks a lot, Norman, for that uh, notification. To our viewers and those that are joining us online, I'd like to thank you, at least those of you that joined early. I know that there are a lot of people that are going to be coming in and joining us as we go along in the program, but thank you for joining us now. If you missed the flyer on Facebook and you can see the lady that I'm speaking to now on your screens, I'm sure you know it's going to be a very exciting conversation. But I'd just like to just keep welcoming those of you that are coming in and probably just give a minute or two for everyone else to come in as we just converse with Uzi and just talk about stories before going into the class of today's matter. Now, before we start, uh, I'm not sure how many of you know or have seen rhinos. I'd just like to see people commenting in the Facebook comment section. If you, have, if you know or you have seen a rhino, just let me know. Because you can also come in right now and tell me if you know I've seen one. <laughs> um, I yeah, really I was... need to like a book. You know, there are interesting fun facts that I got to find out about rhinos, and that's pretty much what we're going to be discussing today. So just let me know what you know about them. I was just going to say, uh, Patrick, as people uh, begin to speak to us in the chat there, that I was thinking on that incidentally earlier today, because I read the news that we are reintroducing the rhino um, in, I believe, in Konare Show. And so I asked myself this question this morning, have I actually ever seen a rhino live? And I'm realizing I haven't, which is interesting. So I've put that under my uh, bucket list goals, <laughs> see a rhino live. You know, it's, it's, it's in, and this is exactly why I asked, because when I was just doing a bit of background, check it to what rhinos are like. I, like, I think I've seen one, country, probably quite young, but it was interesting to me to find out that the African white rhino is actually second largest to the elephant. You know, it's two meters high and four meters in length and weighs about 2.3 tons. Wow. And when I talk about two meters high, we're two, yeah, 2.3 tons. And when we're wow. talking about two meters high, that's like your standard your frame. Mm -hmm. So that's how high a rhino is. That thing is not short, clearly. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> It's quite tall, and it's interesting because that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. We're just going to be discussing uh, uh, on the money uh, with reference to the rhino today and the lessons that we learn. And uh, for those of you that might not know, we have Kuzayin Bayo with us today. Um, and those of you that do know her, I'm sure you know that we are going to have a very exciting conversation. I'll just give her some time to introduce herself after I speak briefly again about what the rhino does. Uh, now, normally the rhino is a physical animal uh, for those that might not have seen it, but it does tend to get a bit aggressive when it wants to protect its young one. What's the young one of a rhino called? No one has commented in the comment section. I think it's called a calf. When it wants to protect its calf, it's very overprotective. So it will charge against any situation that threatens it. That's what it does. It charges down against anything that's on its way and wants to uh, harm its calf. Now, as Old Mutual and in the On The Money program, this financial education program that we're in now, we consider the secret of the rhino to be charging down debt. If you are in debt and that's threatening your financial position, then we consider the secret of the rhino to be a situation where you want to charge at any debt that you have and reduce it by any means necessary. And this is why we're going to be having Kuti with us today to just discuss, you know, debt management techniques, what debt is, how you can charge down on your debt, whether you should be getting into debt in the first place, what kinds of debt you need to be getting into, is there any such thing as good or bad debt, and this is what our conversation is being uh, centered on today. So if you know any friends that are in debt, I'm sure they are, they are quite a number. Uh, if you know anyone that's in debt, just uh, tag them, let them know that the session is beginning now, or you can also just begin to share on your Facebook page so, so that anyone in your contact list can can have a watch of you, what we are going to be discussing today. So over to you now, Kuzi. I mean, this is not the first time that you've been on the show. Uh, you're not new to it. And for those that are joining in now uh, might know you, but for the sake of those that are probably seeing you for the first time, how would you introduce yourself to them? Uh, thank you very much, Patrick. My name is Kuzai Mubaiwa, uh, but lest I forget, I was gonna jump in and say that uh, the young one of a rhino is called a baby rhino. Um, <laughs> that said, <laughs> my, my name is Kudzai Mbaiwa, and I am a financial educator, and I also spend a lot of time talking about managing money 
and because I believe that managing money is more important than making it uh, alongside, you know, some of the key tenets of old rituals on the money program. And so I think the best way just to describe myself is that I am a financial educator. I love all things personal finance. I also host a podcast called The Mary Podcast, uh, where we help you to make sound financial decisions. So that's a little bit about me. And I'm sure as you proceed, I'll talk more about what I do and my life experiences in this money. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for that, Kazi. Now, I'm already seeing that there's a message from uh, Boitu Melonare on uh, Facebook, and she's saying it's breaking on her end. I'm hoping that uh, uh, it's not the feed leaving our side that's breaking and getting to her, and maybe it's just an isolated problem, but we'll just try to see how we can sort this out. Maybe the technical team can assist us with that. But if everyone else is hearing us loud and clear, then I hope that the recording uh, will just be as clear as well for Boitu Melonare to catch up. But thank you for joining us, uh, Boiti if we can call you that. I know that's the nickname that most way too many go by. But anyway, we're going to be chatting about the secret of the rhino today and how it charges down debt and takes charge, right? Now, my first question to you could be, is, uh, in your opinion, what, what would you call um, debt and money management? What, what's your opinion on it? What's, what's debt and money management? So what is debt? Um, I believe that it is important to appreciate definitions of everything. Uh, essentially, debt is when someone decides to spend money that they do not have. And uh, again, I think as you, con- 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 as you proceed with the conversations, you can really deep dive on uh, you know, the good sides, if there are any, uh, the bad sides are around that. But let me say, suffice to say, as we begin, it is very important for everybody as part of their money management path to understand how to use debt wisely. And so when you speak about debt management, it, it, I suppose, it betrays the fact that we are aware that there may be instances where it is useful. There may be instances where it can be uh, used in a good way. Uh, but also there are many instances where it might not be used well. And so for me, what is key is the word that is paired with debt there, which is management. And what we are saying is that you need to be in control. The question is, if people think of debt, if people use debt, are they in control? Okay, you know, it's, it's interesting because you, you speak about debt and then you also speak about being in control. So there are, I'm, I'm taking it that there are times when you can be in debt and you can be totally out of control. Now, what practical examples can you give of situations where either you yourself or people that you may know have been in debt and what caused it? You know, how, how do you get into a situation like that and then how do you lead yourself of it and get back on track, so to say? Okay, I think it's, it's truly important and foundational at this stage that it's, it's a foundational truth that must be shared around the etymology of, uh, of debt. Like, how do people end up in debt? My, my belief is that very few people intentionally go around saying, listen, if it's in Shona and I'll be up to credit, you know, uh, it's very few people who go about saying, I want to be in a very bad debt situation. Uh, because everybody wants to sleep well at night. Everybody, I think most people who are normal, uh, want to be loved and appreciated. They do not want to be hated. They do not want to be avoided. They do not want to be called names. They want to be able to use their phone number for normal things without fearing that someone will call them uh, to say, can I have my money now or I'm going to X, Y, Z. And so I realize that for most people, they start with very good intentions Perhaps the intention may be to add to their assets. Uh, Perhaps the intention may be to rescue a certain situation. You've been doing well all along, an emergency occurs, and you realize that you do not have the capacity to treat whatever situation has come. That is how most people end up in debt. Sadly, when that door is opened, it's not that easy to close. I always like to liken debt uh, to falling into a hole. For many people, they unfortunately may begin to sink and dive even deeper, Um, not so easy to get out of the hole. So I would say that my first response around how people then end up in debt is perhaps they're trying to get certain things before they have the money or situations have forced them to be in that space where they need to pay for something and really they do not have capacity at that moment. Okay, uh, now my next question is, I'm going to structure it this way. Now, there, there are obviously threats or signs that uh, people can use to tell that, you know, now I'm about to get into debt, you know. And uh, 
one of the things is that, you know, when you start hearing people say, ah, you, must, you only live once, the decision that you're about to make probably a bad one. You know? uh, I, I work so hard, I need to fund, I need to enjoy myself, you know, you only live once. And there's so many statements like this. Now, what, what are the signs that people can use to tell that I'm just about to get into the head, I'm going to be in a very bad situation when I do? So I have a classic one because a friend of mine uh, put out this tweet, you know, last week. And um, he tweeted in Shona and he says, um, you know, the moment I begin to tell myself, he says, my current mood is that one which says, the moment you begin to feel that, look, after all, money can be made. <laughs> the moment you begin to feel brave, uh, the moment you begin to justify, and it's even worse now with social media, Patrick, the moment you begin to seek validation um, by putting out a tweet or Facebook, you know exactly what you're doing. You're about to fall into a wall. And here's the truth. There are going to be people like you who are going to come in and affirm you. Uh, there are going to be people who do not like you, who want to see you sink. You've got to appreciate that. There are people who like you, yeah. who sympathize and who don't care. There are also people who look at me and, and probably think, look, she's wearing spectacles. People that have spectacles obviously have money. So let's encourage her to spend or to eat the money. She can always get more money. Uh, and so these are some of the signs. The moment you begin to feel a need to write paragraphs or positive statements or confessions, uh, where you need to strengthen yourself, then you know exactly what you're about to do. Uh, but that said, yeah. I think I did say this the other time when we spoke about the secret of the leopard. I'm a big believer that there must be balance in life. And by balance, that means, you know, we must have a bit of good and we must have a bit of um, serious things. We can't spend all of our money in life just doing serious things, uh, paying fees, uh, buying green bars for laundry, you know, and fueling vehicles. Um, and so it is always better if we actually plan for these things uh, so that we don't come to the point where now we suddenly feel, look, I think I'm entitled. Because what happens is if you've not planned, because listen, all of these things, all of these animals work together, Patrick. If you've not planned, the likelihood of them realizing, okay, I've not planned for certain things. I've not budgeted for entertainment. I've not budgeted for joy. Um, if you go too long, at some point, that's how you end up in these extreme things. So in response to your initial question, which was, you know, how, what are the signs? Um, I want to also mix that with the fact that people only get here because there is lack of, of planning. If we would plan for fun and other things, those things we, we start to YOLO. If they were planned for, really, you would never feel guilty. You don't feel the need to justify. You don't feel the need to just bring in other people to uh, confirm that what you're about to do is right or wrong. Because for everything we choose to do, there are people who are going to say yes. Sometimes you may not listen to the ones that say no. But it's interesting because you talk about uh, people seeking validation on Facebook and social media, and I think that's the worst place that you can do it. Um, well, I'll, I'll not get into social media and what it does to people because we are just speaking about the secret of the rhino today and uh, debt management. Now, when it also comes to debt, um, I'll take it that there are probably two kinds of, broadly speaking, that you can get into either personal debt or small business debt. But in your opinion, what are some of the practical pointers that people can use in dealing with either of the two? You know, you get into a debt to fund your business with uh, a personal debt. What, what practical pointers would you just give for that? Yeah, I think, I think it's really important to split them apart like you've done, uh, uh, Patrick, because you may find that the dynamics may, may differ. Let me speak first to personal and then I'll speak to small business because I'm, I'm passionate uh, about both. Now, when it comes to personal finance, it is personal for a reason. It has to do with, with you. And I began to say that uh, that's, I think that's the first thing people should then think about in saying, do I have an overall plan? Um, you know, if you had a plan for yourself, and we spoke about this in the most recent session, if you have a plan or if you had a plan for your life, the likelihood of you falling into debt unnecessarily is very much minimized, uh, or minimized rather, that's the right English. So you want to make sure that you plan in advance for everything that is, uh, you know, the adult, there's the adult boring things we do in life, um, Patrick, which you must just do day to day, which are not exciting. We've got to buy food, we've got to pay bills. Plan for those things. But like I said in the prior submission, from a personal finance perspective, I've personally found it very useful, um, you know, to plan for, because I enjoy traveling and I know that about myself. Personal finance starts from, let me understand myself. What are the things I enjoy, okay? 
And um, let me make sure I account for those things. And this speaks a lot to what we spoke about last time, which is lifestyle. I've got to choose the lifestyle I want. But again, a very important and sobering thought uh, that is related to personal finance has to do with being ready for emergencies. I would say that in my past 10 or so years, plus uh, over a decade of working with individuals, you know, uh, these financial plans, I realized that most times people who are doing well, who are keeping budgets are derailed because perhaps they have not made sufficient provision for emergencies. And so this is a really mm -hmm. big one because you may realize that you're great with your budget, you will balance every month, uh, you are not going about living outside of your means. Your lifestyle is really in order. And then what then happens is that someone very important dies. Like imagine you're a Mkwenyan, you know, mm -hmm. and your father-in-law dies or your mother-in-law dies. You really think that your wife will smile at you or you just say, I have no money. You, you can't say that. You, you will have to make a plan. I'm saying about things that I find in our context. Now, what tends to happen is because it's an emergency situation, uh, most times, if we've not made sufficient provision for those kind of emergencies, or there is a serious illness in the family, um, if we've not made sufficient provision for things like death, for things like, uh, you know, um, illness, you know, things like fire, um, if you go home tonight, I don't know, most of us are at work, if you're at work, if you knock off at 4.30, you get home and you find that your whole house has been burnt to the ground. Just starting from zero, you've got to get clothes, you've got to get, uh, you know, uh, blankets, you've got winter now, you've got to get appliances, you've got to get food. If we do not make sufficient provision for emergencies, most well-meaning people end up in debt. And so the practical point I would say is, provide in advance for the things that are likely to derail you. Provide in advance for the things that are likely to derail you. It's very, 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 very important because most of you guys who are listening in here, you guys are good people, you're great people. You can even afford battles. That's why you're on Facebook right now, right? Because you plan your life well. Um, and it's important then to just make sure you provide for everything you require. Uh, in such a way that before you actually spend your personal money, you have already balanced on paper. And therefore, um, you also take note, you know, uh, as another practical point, uh, Patrick, that even when we make plans, when we make budgets, right, most people forget that there are lots of things, little things they may forget. So over time, of course, you become much more, I would say, um, clinical and perhaps you cover everything over time. Like if you are consistently using a budget tool for six months, by month six, you pretty much cover everything that you pay for in a month. But what tends to happen also with budgets is, and this is really true, especially in our Zimbabwe scenario, where you are perhaps most people may earn in the local currency and inflation is a real thing. Um, the value of a dollar doesn't always stay the same. So I may have budgeted this month, but there are cost overruns in some months. Again, I think a very important point at day is to always make sure when you do a budget, you put in room to maneuver. Uh, perhaps uh, leave a percentage 10 to 20 where you assume that I may overrun. That is very, very important. So in terms of practical pointers, I would say prevention is the first thing uh, because most people only end up in debt because they've not planned adequately. That's practical pointer number one. But more importantly, practical pointers uh, number two is to speak to those of you who are already listening to this program and are already in debt. Uh, like I said, it's like falling into the hole and you are really not interested in uh, how not to fall in a hole. <laughs> you are more interested in how do I get out of this hole? I want to say that the first thing is to recognize where you are. Most people uh, get it wrong because they're in denial. Uh, and again, the normal rhetoric there, Patrick, is to say, who is not in debt? Even the country is in debt, all right? You are not a country. You are a person. So you want to make sure that you first agree with yourself. Um, to accept it is a very important medicine to say, okay, this is not a good place because clearly I only have this much and I've spent that much and I owe. Uh, someone joked and said, I owe, I owe. So off to work I go. So many times people are going to work, not because they want to make a living, but because they owe and they spent the money that they were supposed to spend now sometime in the past. So practical pointers for people already in debt is number one, appreciate that you are in debt. Number two, quantify 
the debt. If you don't quantify, you may run the risk of two things. One is to think that you're in an okay place. Ah, okay, I'm in a bit of debt, but ah, it's not so bad. When you write mm -hmm. it down, you may be surprised that it's actually quite bad, okay? Number two is people who then think, um, you know, it's so bad. And then like we spoke about the other time, bury your heads in the sand. No, get the figures. You may be very surprised that uh, you're, you probably slipped one month or two, but you could get back on track in the next three months. And so it's important to accept it. It's important to quantify it. And then it's important to also get counsel. Talk to people who've been in debt. Talk to financial advisors, which I will always say this has some, and you're free to actually talk to these people at absolutely no cost. And then I would say the fourth and fifth things are to begin now to make a plan where you're saying to yourself, right, I've quantified this. How do I tackle it? I've been accused, a Patrick, of loving Sadza, but there's no better way to explain some of these things. Here, here is a point. If you want to eat a very large bowl of Sadza, right, there is no way you take the entire thing and stuff it in your mouth. You break it down morsel by morsel and you put it into your mouth until it is cleared. And people that really know Sadza know what I'm talking about. They take their time, they pace themselves. And before you know it, what looked like very large Sadza is, is finished. That same approach must be used with debt. Um, unfortunately, it's very easy to accumulate it personally, um, not as easy to begin to extinguish it. And like the rhino would teach us, because apparently they say that the rhino is the fireman in the forest where it sees fires it begins to stamp them out. It cannot stamp out a fire in the entire forest at once, but it can be able to do it, you know, a bit by bit. And so very important to know your debt, uh, quantify it, accept that you're in a bad place, and then say to yourself, what could I realistically do by myself to extinguish this debt? Many times it has a lot to do with us revisiting our personal financial plans and uh, perhaps tripping off things that would be fancy until such a time as we can come back to solid ground. May I quickly say as well that these same principles will pretty much work, you know, in a, in a business setup. But of course, the difference with business is uh, sometimes, uh, you know, debt can be used uh, more often than not in a good way for small business. But I think it's a discussion that is uh, about to come. Yeah. Okay, you know, uh, I like what you just, the, the analogy that you just gave about Saza and debt. That you've got mm -hmm. your plates of salsa and you need to break it down into smaller muscles in order to eat it well. Now, I just want to build on that also because you know you've got soft salsa and you've got hard salsa. <laughs> the soft salsa is easier to eat, and then there's the mm. harder one. The builders. One. I, I like I, I like mine hard. <laughs> so if I'm cooking, I'm just gonna make sure it's hard and heavy. Okay. So, you know, you feel it into your stomach. So now not, I'd like to liken that also to the food and the fat, yes, because uh Terence, uh, one of our viewers on Facebook actually asked a similar question to say, you know, he says he's not sure a lot of people know the difference between good and bad debt. We spend a lot of time on bad debt, and I believe there are some who miss out on growth opportunities that good debt offers. So I just wanted to break it down to say, what's, what's the difference between what we can call good debt and what's bad debt? Okay, fantastic. So yes, I totally agree with our, our listener there. Indeed, there is good debt and there's bad debt. And I know we, we always, always, put great emphasis on the bad one. Uh, perhaps it's because the little things that we tend to do as consumers in personal finance uh, have a habit of finding themselves expressed even when we run our enterprises. And so I think it's a fair thing that we continue to hammer that people know that there is what is called consumptive debt. If you are borrowing to eat, if you are borrowing to wear clothes, if you are borrowing to look good. Um, and I've always said that there is a special type of people who even borrow in a bar Imagine getting drunk on credit, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Patrick, and then waking up the next morning with a terrible, um, uh, you know, uh, hangover, and you still haven't even paid for the beer that made you drunk or the alcohol that made you drunk. And so it's important to appreciate that anything that does not add to you, where you are getting something in advance, and perhaps you are still paying for it after you've consumed it or after you've enjoyed it, is really what we would call. Uh, you know, consumptive debt. So you are still paying month later for that really slick trousers you bought from that clothing company and they said uh, six months to pay, zero interest. There's always these phrases, which I'll talk to at the end, that continue to call us back, even when we get out of debt. And I'm talking about things I've experienced because I started, you know, my first job in a bank in 2003. And by 2005, I had accounts uh, in every 
basically in every store, uh, credit store, uh, Patrick, along Jason Moore, and I'm facing it right now. Okay, so at that time, at the corner of Jason and and second, there was what was called then Barbers, uh, Greater Men's, I don't remember which was which. And then, of course, let me not mention other brands uh, which still exist down the street, but all of them. I was supporting those businesses um, every, every month, and I wasn't paying cash. And so it, it became a matter of learning that over time, I would still be wearing some clothes um, which perhaps had begun to fade. And if you're very unlucky, perhaps auntie at home or your domestic worker uh, burns that shirt and you are still paying for it six months later, but you are not enjoying the benefits. So consumptive debt, we will always call that. But um, you know, our, our good friend here does raise a very important point, and this I wanted to stress, especially from an enterprise perspective, but even for, for those who are self-employed, to say there's what we call productive debt. And indeed, this is why we started by saying it is debt management, where we are saying we can leverage. The word is leverage, right? Um, leverage, simply, leverage simply says, if I'm short, and I am short because I'm exactly uh, 1.535 uh, meters, um, you know, uh, not tall, but short. Um, if I cannot reach something that is above me, I get onto a chair, I climb onto a stool, and I'm able to reach that thing. We call that leverage. And there's a way we can use debt in a positive way, uh, even at personal finance level or at business level. We are simply saying, do the math. There are places where you're saying, I have a business, I have an enterprise. It, perhaps it has been tested because it's not a completely new thing. Most new businesses will fail. And perhaps I have been in the business of making uh, peanut butter because I have a peanut butter machine. And so I am a food processor, if I may call myself that. Now, I know that around my neighborhood, in the local stores, people are loving my peanut butter. I'm able to produce 100 bottles a day with the one machine. And then demand begins to outstrip you know, my supply. It may make sense for me then to say, listen, if I try and sell many bottles of uh, peanut butter first, then take that money to buy a machine, it will take me forever. There is demand now and now. Because, you know, we are Zimbabweans and Africans. We put peanut butter in everything, you know, in rice, in porridge, on ourselves. Look, we just put it everywhere. <laughs> so here's a thought. Why not approach an SME section of a bank like Cabs, because Old Mutual has a bank, and talk to those guys. Guys, I've been running this enterprise for the past whatever number of months. These are my flaws, as you can see. And I'm looking forward, if I'm able to borrow from you guys, if I'm going to use this for the sake of mathematics, at 20% per annum, I know that my business gives me 40% or 50% per annum. So I can grow fast. I can get a second machine, a second place, uh, a second employee or a third employee, more bottles, more working capital, more peanuts, everything I require, I can double or triple or quadruple my production. And I can put out more bottles of uh, peanut butter into many shops. I'm sure by now you can all tell that I like peanut butter. And so at that, at that point, it is productive, Dead Patrick. We're saying that for an enterprise that has been tested, not just every enterprise, because you do ruin an enterprise um, if you start it off you know, by, by debt. Not all enterprises will require debt to be started. Most of them require a proof of concept. So yes, in short, or in summary, there are places where we can use in a meaning, use debt in a meaningful way. And for certain enterprises, particularly to scale, is a great way to use it. Another example that is touted is where perhaps you are saying, I have an opportunity to get a mortgage. Right? I appreciate um, that I am banking with a certain bank. I go to my bankers, listen, I've been renting for a long while. I realized that for the past five years, if I had not been renting, everything I paid to my landlord could have built me or could have gotten me a nice stand somewhere and perhaps built a basic cottage. I am ready to cross over uh, to ownership. And so where you realize that if you do the math, it makes sense. And it's very important. I'll keep emphasizing that when it comes to leverage, you must do the math. Because for some people, they can yeah. actually get into um, a debt for business or for mortgages and it kills them. Okay, so you must be able to demonstrate from your cash flow that you can comfortably pay. It makes sense if your rent is $100 per month and you're able to get a mortgage where you're paying, uh, you know, less than that or equal or even slightly more, maybe 110 Because every single dollar you're paying, Patrick, each month is making you one step closer to becoming an entire owner. And you're putting this into an asset that by itself can appreciate what we call capital appreciation. And so, yes, it's very important to recognize that there are points and places where we can actually use it in a good and a positive and a meaningful way, as long as the math makes sense. If the return you're getting is much, much greater 
than how much the cost of borrowing is, then you're in a good place. And this, this is all that bankers do. Really. So sometimes when you walk in there, they say you can't mm-hmm. find anything. It's not because they hate you, but they've done the math. And so it's very important to always, always do the math. You know, thank you for that. And I think you answered it very comprehensively, almost to a point where you just uh, took all the rest of my questions. And <laughs> no, I'm happy to still. I was going to ask you, yeah. <laughs> was, was to ask you about, you know, uh, lef- leveraging debt for wealth creation and, you know, using it to your advantage. And then uh, Terence also asked the question here to say, people, do people really understand the total cost of borrowing or folks uh, are still focusing on interest rates? And I know you touched on that mm. as your response, but. Um, could you just shed a bit more light on it as well? Because like you say, you know, people tend to focus more on, on the interest rate and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, if the interest rate is high, but then what's the total cost of borrowing that people might also just look, need to look into? I know you spoke about things to do with the mortgages and, and, mm-hmm. and you know, other the productive debt that you also mentioned, but could you just uh, touch a bit just to give uh, Terence some satisfaction that we responded to his question as well. Sure, that's fine. Uh, Terence, thank you very much for keeping them coming. Please keep coming through. I want to say that you are you are very right because I did take a very basic approach because we are building on this and we'll do this uh, on this in months um, and, and episodes to come. So true that there is um, what I would call the very simple monetary interest rate. So the one example I gave, 10% versus 25%. Uh, but again, there are also a whole lot of non-monetary things you want to think about. Um, uh, one which people may need to think about is if I am borrowing and I want to uh, secure land and then hopefully build something simple and perhaps try and think that I am reducing my living costs because I now own the thing. Um, there are a whole number of costs. There are bank charges that come with every transaction. There are legal costs that come with certain large transactions as well. You want to be ready for those. And that's why, you know, saving, which is one of the secrets we treat of the lion, is a very important thing because it helps you to start off in a good place. So you can actually be able to mix savings uh, with debt. Uh, if you end up living in a place that's so far away uh, that you have to put in so much fuel that it really defeats <laughs> Uh, the purpose of purchasing. Then again, those are some of the things that, you know, there are dynamics with every situation. I think you yeah. put it rightly, Terence, when you say you then have to think about the, the total cost. Um, I was speaking to someone today who lives outside of the town and they're re- considering because they used to live in town, coming back into the city center. And the conversation was, okay, when I left, what was happening? I realized that I didn't have, not have as much cash then. Um, but in, in having moved out, the only thing I did was to transfer my issue uh, and say, I can try and get money in bits and pieces. Uh, but overall, what I'm actually now paying for in a month is much more <laughs> than what I used to pay when I was just in a place that seemed I, I was paying a bit more. So total cost, always very, very important. Uh, there is the monetary cost. There's also the non-monetary. Um, if you, again, I'm going to give an example. And uh, rural people have to forgive me, but I lived there for a while and I had an aunt who I stayed with. And we always joke about um, how Rua actually requires a visa because it's just so far. Um, <laughs> look, you guys almost passed through a toll game, so to be fair. Now, if you're living that far and you're driving so late at night and so early in the morning just to get to work, there is another cost, which is the cost on your health itself. And so it's, it's very, very important to also think about those. So I want to say that generally for most of us as Zimbabweans, we are biased towards a, a first you know, um, uh, financial security asset, which is a home, and it's quite good. But I think then in doing your mathematic, you want to then make sure that you put what I would call an all-in uh, costing mechanism. Think about everything. Think about how far it takes to get there. Think about the costs that are legal of uh, securing a particular property. Uh, basically, a good book for those that believe in the Bible talks about how a man is about to build must first count the cost. So yes, you must count the cost in monetary terms, you must count the cost in non-monetary terms. Uh, but that said, you did uh, say uh, something about, you know, a wealth um, a practice. And I think I emphasize a lot on the business side of things, but I do believe that we can leverage debt towards, um, you know, wealth building. Now, another interesting aspect or angle, and I think Terence would be interested by this one. And uh, I've, I've had a lot of back and forth with friends who've also walked this path, is where you say to yourself, I am entrepreneurial by nature. If you secure a house, yes, it may look like the cost is looking high, but once you have that asset in hand, um, you can leverage that same asset as well. And so I do totally agree that one's first house most times is a very important asset to have, which can then 
be leveraged, but we must trade with caution here because you can lose a spouse uh, in addition to the house <laughs> and be left as a mouse. I just needed to drop some bars <laughs> there. <laughs> spouse, house, mouse, go with me here. So what we're saying is all of these things, I mean, look, this is just a program where we're talking to our uh, very loyal old mutual fans, but on a case-by-case -case basis, the cost must then be made. I know people who have leveraged you know, mortgages to secure their first houses, and they always make sure that they cut the cloth according to their size. One of my uh, mentors was a very wealthy woman, Zimbabwean woman, um, always says to me that she started off by buying houses or her first property in places that she was not really interested in living in the long run. And I think there's lots to be learned there. Um, I know, for example, that um, you know, CABS was running a number of schemes that had low-cost housing. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was that very popular Bolidiro one. And you know, first, slowly, then suddenly, you know, everything is being snapped up because there are people who had vision. I remember speaking to someone, uh, Patrick, who had uh, two people actually I can highlight for that specific scheme. Um, who, how, and I just want to demonstrate how they used this, this you know, uh, debt in order to leverage it for, for wealth. One of them purchased it for his child. Yeah, he said, listen, I already have a house for myself and I want to gift the next generation with something that they can get started in. And they picked up that house, took up the mortgage instead of uh, buying their kids very expensive toys and nothing wrong with that. Right. Uh, but look, you cannot live in a PS4 or PS5, or whatever it is they call it now. But if that child and the child is nine years old now, um, the parents have finished paying off. It's a kid who has titled this because the parents had foresight to think about generational wealth. So that's how one way we can actually leverage, you know, debt. And they, they've said to themselves, if the Lord were to take us, God forbid, today, we are in a very comfortable place because we've made provision, but we've leveraged debt to do it. Okay. And then there's also the issue of people who say to themselves, I'm entrepreneurial. I know a person who actually snapped up uh, two of those houses, not because they wanted to live in them, but because they understand that they come with title. And now with that title, they use that as leverage to borrow in certain spaces, in uh, decent currencies that they can put into their enterprises and they can take a risk on themselves with something that they've already taken a risk on, which was that mortgage and securing the house in itself. And so it's important for ordinary people to understand that, yes, there is bad debt. And the only reason, because there's a connection between these two, particular, I'll say this as a, a perhaps in closing on this score, there is a reason why we want you out of consumer debt. I will keep saying this. It's because we want you to create fiscal space in your financial plan. Now, if you use $100 every month and $30 or $50 is going towards debt, in a year, half of what you've made is just repaying things. Now, for most people, I know this for a fact, their lives would be okay if they didn't necessarily have more money, but were just debt free. So if I could get my whole hundred bucks and I could spend it the way I want, and I'm the one who is, remember I said at the beginning, it's a control issue. If I can stay in control, then I, I choose where I deploy my money. I can put it in investments. Right now, you know, people are very excited. I saw people are really excited. I think when I checked last, last night, and I'm, I'm excited myself because I'm a participant in, you know, the old Mitchell's uh, ETF, right? I'm excited because I've put in a bit of money some time back and, you know, it's doing well. The underlying assets are doing well, so it's gone up. Who doesn't want money to grow? But you can't participate in those things because if you're riddled with debt, every month, as soon as you receive your salary, you are like a conveyor belt. You are receiving and then other people are just passing by, picking, 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 and you are right at the end there and there's literally nothing for you. Now, if we were to take charge of our personal finance, and minimize and completely extinguish, like the rhino does, consumptive debt. Then that room we were using or that amount of money we were using, we can then convert to the productive. So can I convince some? I know you, are, you guys are irritated in hearing the same thing, but if we get out of consumptive debt, we can then use that. Because listen, you are not living with that money anyway. So next month, you can then invest that money and it will make you more money. And if we decide to live for a very short time, in an extraordinary way, then in the long run, we can also be able to live in an extraordinary way, but in the positive. Those are my submissions. Um, just the thought that, listen, if we can take charge of our monies and make sure that we are living in the moment, because each time you borrow, yeah, especially for consumptive debt, you are stealing from your future. You are literally, I always say this, you are a time traveler. You know, you go into the future, take money from the future and you spend it now. 
But the same person will say, no, I don't believe in science fiction, yet you are living it today. So let's take charge on this one, Dr. Shapur. Let's take charge. Let's consume, uh, let's make sure that consumptive debt, we stamp it out as quickly as possible. Uh, if, you, if it means closing that clothing account, if it means telling Maeve, listen, I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, I'm not coming there. I'll just pay you what I owe, and then I'll only buy cash from you. Uh, small little things like that always add up. And that which we are able to redeem from not borrowing, we can put into investments and make use of the money we already have. Thank you for that, because, uh, you know, I was going to say preach the full pitch is yours if you want to talk about this. <laughs> I must give you time, uh, yeah. I must also just say that, you know, the last question that I asked you from Terence was actually prefixed by saying, Patrick, in your experience, then he asked the question, which means he was asking me the question, but I wasn't going to about to start sharing my experience when you were there, so I just threw it at you, but thank you for dealing with it uh, that way. Now, you've spoken, the, the big words that you've been using in your explanation of things, you talked about fiscal space, and uh, earlier on you talked about the mathematics of it all. And I just wanted to understand that is this term like, uh, you know, debt to income ratio? Mm -hmm. um, what, what is that and what's an acceptable debt to income ratio? Okay, that's a really, really big one. And I think for people who've been listening, I want this to be a call to action and a takeaway. If you're able to do that now, the better. If you're not, then perhaps do this, um, you know, when you get home with your spouse. I always find these engagements, Patrick, very useful because money is a very sensitive thing. Uh, many times some people are derailed because they are coupled with uh, a partner uh, who might be misbehaving. Because you might be listening and saying, look, I'm okay. Is, is that woman or that man who I left at home, okay, who has a problem? Now, go home and say, baby, do you know what a debt-to-income ratio is? And we're going to tell you what that is. It is as simply as it is explained. It is basically the interface or how do you compare the amount of debt you have right now to your income. So here's a simple live example. If my income is $100 uh, per month, right? And of that $100 every month, $30 is going towards different debt payments. So I'm paying for clothes. I am paying, uh, you know, most people when they end up in emergencies go to, I, I can't remember the English term for that. Achimbaz, what, what, what's that then again? Uh, you know, those credit sharks. Um, Yes, loan sharks, yes. I was going to say microfinance, but that would be unfair because there's really good microfinance. It's the loan sharks, right? And look, we're a landlocked country. Most of us have never seen a shark, but we've all have seen this on TV. They bite, okay? So people run away when they see sharks. They don't, they don't go towards them. And so what would happen is if $30 every month out of 100 that I earn is being repaid towards debt, then I would say that um, my debt-to-income ratio is, uh, you know, uh, three uh, is to 10, okay, or 30%. And that, incidentally, is a threshold that we say one must not go above. Preferably, you want to make sure that you do not have more. I mean, if you find yourself doing 50-50 with people that owe you money or institutions that you owe money to rather um, every month, then there is a real problem. And again, you know, life is not exciting and it's not motivating because what then happens is that for every hundred bucks you get, you're giving someone half of the money you're making. Um, and you're also ba basically just saying, listen, um, I'm working for someone else. Um, and so we need to reclaim and make sure that if you're in a bad place, do the math, whatever your total debts are, divide those by, what, by whatever income you get. And the percentage you get will tell you how good or how bad or how terrible things are. Remember I said at the beginning, it is important to quantify. To quantify by itself could be a solid number. Okay, everything that I owe if I add it up is $100. It looks like small money, um, but if I then realize that I earn 20, then that's not a good thing. Because if I do the debt to income ratio, we have a really big problem there. And so not only must you know the absolute figure of in total, what do I owe? Also know how much am I repaying per month uh, versus my income. So that debt to income ratio, try and make sure that if you are in debt, bring it down first to 30%. And then thereafter, try and make it as low as possible. If you can get to zero, that would be lovely. But it would also be nice that if you do maintain any kind of debt, even if it is the good one, because we must remember that even if it's good debt, if you're borrowing for business or you're borrowing for a mortgage, 
you still need to eat, you still need to wear clothes, you've got to fuel the vehicle, you've got to pay fees, you've got to get your hair done and other things that include life. So that 70% uh, is important to make sure that you live well and you're not just working for debt. The lower, the better. Okay, so that would be great. Okay, thank you for that. Now, um, earlier also you spoke about how, you know, some time back you had the uh, Yes, with some of these retail stores, your barbers, the greater, and just to mention those that have, are no longer existing. And you mentioned that there were others also that are still there that you haven't mentioned. Now, getting into debt with these uh, institutions, right, will obviously affect what people also call a credit score. And uh, could you just touch briefly on that and whether or not it matters in our environment? Okay, this one is a very, it's a potentially cont uh, contentious one. But um, let me start the conversation anyway, because it's a courageous conversation that must be had. Now, it's very interesting to take note that um, in more developed nations, debt is very much available. Like we did explain before, it can be leveraged in a nice way as a tool for wealth creation. But like a knife uh, that has no character of its own, uh, it only gets character depending on who's using it. So someone may use a kitchen knife to do what should be done. I am cutting vegetables, I'm cutting meat and things like that. But it's unfortunate and we've read of cases where people take knives of that nature and kill people. I want to say that uh, many times credit is a tool that can be useful in the hands of a person depending on how they understand how it can be used. And so I want to say that a credit score, many people have said, look, it doesn't matter. I can just wild because I'm in Zimbabwe. Who cares about credit scores? It's because perhaps we are not reading Patrick. Credit scores... Um, are increasingly beginning to matter. For one, we do have a credit uh, bureau in Zimbabwe. Um, you might just not know it, but each time you open a bank account and you supply them with your details, the reason they don't necessarily uh, do it you know, overnight uh, or instantly many times if it's a proper serious account is because they want to take time for sending your details uh, to what is called um, FCB, which is pretty much uh, you know, a bureau that checks whether you are owing money. And I know people who've experienced this, you are owing money to a certain utility company and then you want to apply for a certain thing and then they say there is a trace. They're basically saying we can be able to see that there's a point where you borrowed and there are outstanding issues. So it's good to have a good credit score. Uh, first, in the sense of you are not uh, owing monies that are overdue. But then there's also the thinking, which is why I say this is contentious about how often times for you to get bigger debt? In the scoring system, they will tend to ask you, have you had credit elsewhere? And I have to be honest with me, um, that is why you know, at some point in time, I did keep, I shut down all of the other accounts. I did keep one single one, but I'm in control of it for the simple reason that mm -hmm. when I wanted to apply for certain other things, they needed something that would demonstrate that I know how to get debt and use it without going wild. Now, unfortunately for many people, if they open a clothing account, for every occasion, uh, if there's a green wedding, you want to get a green suit. If there's an orange wedding, you now want to get an orange suit. And then you have a red suit. By the end of the year, your wardrobe is looking like a packet of fleeces. Okay, because you have a suit <laughs> in a very bright color for every occasion. And I'm not saying dress boring. I'm just saying you can pay cash for things like clothes. So that delicate balance is very important. This is why we say there's what we call good debt and bad debt. You could use clothing accounts as a way for you to demonstrate in the future when you're applying for much bigger amounts that I appreciate how debt is used and I can demonstrate that I know what it means to commit to repaying something every month. But don't let those things be in control. If I can tell you that the one clothing account, and I won't mention, I have not used or touched in two years. <laughs> um, I occasionally pick up something just so that I still have a score when I want to apply for certain things where I use it for good debt. But I've trained myself over the years that I pay cash for clothing. I will not die if I have five changes of good clothing. Okay, I can accumulate and pay cash as I go. Um, and I think it's very important for you to understand that it does matter. It does matter whether you owe or not. If you're going to participate in the formal financial systems of this country, then it is necessary that you maintain a good score. So demonstrate that you can be able to repay where you can, but at the same time, don't let that become a crutch that you always use. I'll say this in parting, uh, I, because these ones are 
companies that have closed, you know, at that time it was greater means I remember now. Um, I initially bought in there because I wanted to get clothing. I was a bank, I wanted to look formal, uh, look smart and all of those things. But what then tends to happen is you get in there, there's a really nice perfume. Imagine smelling nice on credit, guys. Come on, come on. Hmm? Very good we love well. Come on, guys. I mean, for some of these things, just pay cash, <laughs> you know. Um, and so I then eventually got into a hallway because they would make hot meals as well. And it would allow you to buy anything really from your card. It's your card. <laughs> now, that's a real problem. Uh, where now even the food you eat, you borrow. And before you know it, because it's just easy when you keep swiping or uh, when they keep charging it, you're like, oh, charge it to my account. Or oh, it, looks, it looks cool. Um, it got so bad to the extent that I was living by myself in town. I could no longer afford to live by myself because I couldn't catch up with bills because half my salary was going um, towards that. And you know what then ended up happening, uh, Patrick? I went to HR mm -hmm. and asked for an advance because now I couldn't afford even to leave. <laughs> and many people, the moment you start going through that whole, and I always say when I talk about debt, these are things I've lived. The moment you borrow from your salary for next month, you are in a bad place. That tells you you're not living within your means and you've been in a really bad place. It took me a while to get out of that hole, but suffice to say, I will not go back there again because those were dark times, uh, Patrick. So your credit score matters. You want to make sure that you still uh, maintain a clean slate so that for the things that matter, you will be accepted into more serious credit because you demonstrate that you are a faithful being. Very, very important. Now, if, I think you touched on a lot there, and I think it's quite important. Everything that you spoke about, because now I was thinking that you know, if your credit score is good, then you've also got access to higher credit limits. Mm -hmm. But I also just wanted to find out maybe as a, my penultimate question to you is to say, what are the dangers that could arise from credit and, and what are your thoughts on guarding against this? Because if your credit score is good, then you can get mm -hmm. good credit as well. But then Absolutely. what are the dangers that arise from that? I think I'd begun to touch on that when I spoke of my personal experience. And because my work uh, allows me to speak with thousands of ordinary Zimbabweans in every year, uh, most people would testify the same. We all start out meaning well, Patrick. Um, I'll just get the one suit because, uh, you know, I am, I am the father at my sister's wedding and I cannot walk her in without the theme color. Okay, fine. But what then tends to happen is that you open up a door that most people have problems closing. And so I think it takes having very courageous conversations with yourself to say, my intent is so that I have a good score. And um, then you want to make sure that if it's a card or it's a, a particular account, you don't make use of it on the daily or on the monthly. Extinguish that debt as soon as possible and uh, service it as fast as possible. You will still maintain your score. You have a reference you are done. Some people even do it to the extent that they'll open it and then they close it uh, because apparently systems allow uh, you know, certain companies to still be able to say, could I had an account with us you know, in uh, 2010 or something like that. That's good enough. You have your credit score. So you've got to then now be deliberate to say, I will not use debt for consumptive things. Yeah. I also find that it's um, the other danger is not you. Um, but sometimes, you know, people will see this really nice jacket. Oh, could see this is a really nice gray jacket. Oh, yeah, by the way, I picked it up in XYZ uh, store. Oh, really? Okay, interesting. Um, uh, did you pay cash? No, no, I have, I have an account, so I can just buy whenever. Oh, you know, I can't meet credit score. Would you be so kind just to get me a two-piece outfit, and then I will service it? And then you being nice to the neighbors or to family or friends, um, you end up being exposed to debt that has nothing to do with you. You are paying for a suit you've never worn. Um, and that becomes a really great danger for a lot of people. Um, let me also speak to the loan shark debt. Those guys are pretty convenient. Um, they will not ask for much paperwork for most people. Many times they operate in a very informal way. Um, but the danger that then comes is that you may end up losing very valuable things at absolutely uh, poor value. You are losing a set of sofas. You are losing a house even. I know of people this afternoon, just this afternoon, I had a conversation with a woman who was in a really bad place because her spouse kept on borrowing to the extent that they lost a house in a really great affluent suburb in the, in the country. So you see, the thing is, like I said at the beginning, it's like falling into a hole. Now, the problem with many people is when they fall into that hole, instead of trying to work their way out, they begin to dig even deeper. So it's preferable if I know that this path has holes. I avoid it. Use a different path so that you don't 
encounter the wall at all. And so I want to say that when that door is opened, really um, anything can happen. Preferably do not open the door uh, or alternatively lock it up and uh, put the key somewhere that is um, inaccessible so that you are not tempted to keep using it. Otherwise, if you are buying now your, your, your millimil, you know, on credit, then you must know that there is a real problem there. Pay cash. Normalize paying cash where you can for consumptive things. Um, now, unfortunately, because, because of our time, we might we need to wrap up. We've got about five minutes on the block left. Okay. And uh, I know you've said a lot, but I still need to give you that time to just give up your parting shots to the listeners and the viewers that are out there. Um, what, what, what parting shots would you have for them in terms of uh, managing debt? Okay, I want to say that I believe that the major goal that many of us have is to have attain financial freedom. And you can never have freedom when you know that you are not in control of your money. And this is what debt does, does to us, uh, particularly debt that is not managed well. And so my call to action for all of us is to really sit down, review our lives, compute what our debt to income ratios are, and understand where we stand. Let's begin to extinguish debt as quickly as possible. Let's be like a rhino, which is resolute. They say that when a rhino is being attacked or when it is attacking you, it will come straight at you. It is so resolute to the extent that they say, Patrick, even if you deviate to the right or the left, yeah, it will still keep coming for you even if you run away. <laughs> and so that being resolute is very important. Quantify the debt. Identify that which has the biggest interest rates and begin to treat that one first. Because sometimes it feels like I'm not making progress. It's because you are perhaps not treating the one that keeps bleeding you. Okay, there are many ways of treating debt. This is one of them, which is to say target big figures first. But for some people, if you really feel that that won't work and you need motivation, if you have a string of debts, maybe start with a few of the small ones and you have 10, you can then celebrate that, listen, I have extinguished at least three out of 10. I'm now only left with seven, okay? I also want to say, be very ruthless with yourself when it comes to getting out of debt. Why? The motivation of financial freedom must be higher than being told by your money what to do every month. And so even if it means, and this is what some of us, and I'm talking about things I know um, and have experienced, it may mean selling a car. There was a time, uh, a very dark time in my life, uh, Patrick, where I could tell that things were not shaping well. And I'd made a few bad decisions. One of them included starting an enterprise that was new, a biological um, asset one, and so poultry went to something uh, with money I did not have and starting at a larger scale that I would be able to do. Let me say that a car was lost in that process because you go out and you borrow and you know chickens start doing the things. You, know? <laughs> you have a batch of a thousand, you've never kept 10 chickens your whole life. All right, half of them uh, die because of a disease. The other quarter are bitten by a snake. The one that remains are bitten by dogs. And then the other quarter are rained on. And then you put the difference into a freezer to be slaughtered. Power goes out and they go bad. And you are now left with maybe out of a thousand, I'm just being very dramatic here, a hundred. What then tends to happen? You try and sell them. You know that the money won't cover it. So whoever just comes, like, I want to chicken. Just get one. You know, you end up just giving people. And the person yes. who you borrowed from is not waiting and smiling. They want their money back. And so sometimes instead of waiting for money uh, or assets to be lost, you yourself can decide. You decide to say, I think my financial freedom is more important. Let me go out here and let me sell my $5,000 car, get $2,000 out of it, buy a smaller vehicle, take the $3,000, pay wherever I also that I can sleep at night. Because in conclusion, people that are not in consumer debt sleep well. People that are in bad debt have nightmares of people knocking at their door. They dream falling in holes. You want to make sure that you are healthy, wealthy, and happy. How do you do this? Take control of your money, extinguish your debt, get a really great debt to income ratio, and whatever it is that you freed that you used to be paying for via debt, that amount, begin to put it in investments uh, with institutions such as yourselves. So this is my parting shot, uh, uh, Patrick, to say that for all of us, if we choose to take control of our money, it will end in wealth. So go out and do great things.
Thank you so much, Kuzi. I think those were really good parting shots and right on time as well. Um, I, I mean, you've been an amazing guest as usual. Uh, so thank you so much for coming online and uh, sharing these financial management tips with us. Now, when we began the program, we just described how large the rhino was and everything that you've described fits into that description of a rhino to say it's about two meters tall, four meters uh, long or four meters in length. And if it's charging down against uh, any predator or any animal that threatens its calf, it makes sense that we should only charge down uh, on our deaths like the rhino does given its size. But I also just have one more interesting fun fact for the viewers that are watching now. And, and this has to do with the fact that, did you know that the rather, uh, uh, rhinos have very poor vision and at times they attack trees and rocks by accident. I don't know if any of you knew that, but to the viewers now, I'm challenging you as the viewers and our listeners to use this fun fact and spin it around to give a financial management tip. Now, could you use the size of the rhino and how big it was? I just wanted to use that, uh, that, that interesting fact to say if they've got poor vision and they sometimes chance down against trees and rocks by accident, how could you spin that around to give a financial management tip? under this uh, uh, pillar of the rhino in the financial management program. But that being said, we'd like to end our program here today and uh, wish you well and that you can join us in the next uh, two weeks for the next On The Money program that we're going to be hosting. Otherwise, for now, from myself and uh, from Kuzi as well, we'd just like to thank you for joining us and wish you well. Thanks. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Awesome, Kuzi. Thanks a lot. All right, cheers.